so it was requested that I basically do a video explaining um, stuff to do with the halberd. So I'm going to try and manoeuvre it, which is very difficult inside because it's eight foot long. And in this particular section of the house, the ceiling is not high enough to manoeuvre it. So as you can see, I'm having to slowly turn it around using a doorway. So this was the halberd I built, so I made it from a forged head. Um, obviously I didn't forge the head myself, I am completely useless at doing stuff like that. And I mounted it onto this ash shaft I bought, um, which has proper edge alignment because it's an actual spear shaft. I had to grind it down as you can see near the top. I did an okay job of it, certainly not an excellent job, but a good enough job. It's been perfectly stable whenever I've been using it. Um, as said, there are people who are obviously much better at woodworking who can get the pole ground exactly to the right angle for mounting this, but I didn't have the right tools or the right training to do it, and I've done a good enough job as it stands. So, what this video is going to be about is more of the history, really, of pole arms and what makes them so effective. So, obviously, not effective in today's world, but in the sort of medieval world and um, sort of primitive combat, if you want to call it that. What made these pole arms so effective? So there's a couple of things to consider with a pole arm. In this type of video we're going to be covering things like halberds and English bill hooks and similar things to that where they primarily have a cutting edge, although I have not sharpened this one. Um, you've got your main spear kind of point at the top and then you've got your reverse spike or beak. That has two functions really, pulling riders um, out of you know horseback and stuff like that, or gripping uh, enemy soldiers. I'm going to have to tighten some of the screws up on this as well because they've come a bit loose. And uh, puncturing armour. So that's its kind of primary role. So obviously the halberd, as you can imagine, and I said this isn't a great place to demonstrate it, but good luck trying to demonstrate one of these in a house, is primarily a thrusting weapon. As you can probably see, I've demonstrated that before. The weight and length of the halberd means this spike on the end goes through most things with pretty much good ease. So. The halberd was basically an upgrade to the spear in many ways. Um, and obviously, as I said, when I use the word halberd in this video, I'm going to be talking about halberds that look like this. But really, you could be covering any kind of um, sort of pole arm with similar properties, you know, like a front cutting edge, the spike uh, top spear, and a reverse sort of um, armor grappling point or an armor piercing point. So. It replaced the spear for obvious reasons. Now, this is about eight foot from tip to tail on this halberd. Um, if you had a typical European spear, I think that would be about six foot, if you included, you know, like a six foot pole with the spearhead not being too big. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions we get from history, um, in terms of films, not from obviously accurate history, is that everybody fought with swords and shields. Um, there's this very sort of, I guess, dramatized Hollywood version of the medieval period and older periods where every single soldier wore very heavy armour um, they had spears, uh, not spears, sorry, they had shields and swords and that's how uh, combat was fought when in reality that wasn't the case at all In obviously it does vary on country and time period but generally for a lot of these periods you had people who were lightly armoured or had no armour um, in massive formations um, normally with spears um, if you go back to ancient Greece spears and the hoplites, you know, that was a thing. The big exception I can think is Rome where the gladius short sword was basically used in, in you know, instead of a spear. Um, but through most of, you know, this sort of period of history, most nations fought with uh, soldiers with spears. Why? Because of logistics, which is another thing people never seem to factor in, uh, annoyingly when they talk about history. If you, if two nations are fighting, um, and one nation can field far more men and train them quickly because they're using a much cheaper weapon that's quite effective, they will generally win. Um, which is, you know, something lots of people don't understand. They think if you know one nation built a spear that was slightly better than the other nation's spear, but it cost two or three times as much and was longer to train a soldier to use it, they would win. They'd probably lose just from being outnumbered um, because logistics is very important when it comes to war. It's basically what wins war for the most part. So, for a lot of um, you know this sort of period, you had the spear, and the spear was very, very effective, but obviously there's a couple of drawbacks to the spear. One, if you are fighting somebody of heavy armour, it's very difficult to kill them, because the spear point, even though it's got a lot of force behind it, isn't you know ideal for puncturing armour. Um, also, the spear is only really good against one target at a time, and you know, 
you've only got the actual spearhead. What I'm trying to get across of this is if you look at the halberd, it's more like a Swiss army knife. It's a bit more versatile in many ways because you've got a couple of different ways of using it. So, in generally halberds are for formation use, not single combat, although obviously they could be used for that. What's called a pole axe, which in many ways is like a shorter halberd, of some of those they have different heads, but it's designed to be lighter and faster to use, and generally six foot, not eight foot long, or five foot, not eight foot long. Um, those pole axes are generally what people consider, in, they normally have like a lighter axe head, you know, everything's smaller on them because they're designed to be faster to swing around. What the advantage a halberd gives you, or similar types of pole arms, is when you have lots of men in formation, they have multiple different weapons they can use. Now, this big flat bit of the axe here, that's very good because it blocks more incoming things. If you've got a formation of halberd, or halberd ears, or however you pronounce it, or like this with their axe blades at slightly different angles but they're in formation, that blocks a lot of things coming in because you can't, you obviously can't thrust through this with your own weapon, or this side. That's blocking it there. So it's basically, even if you think of it initially like this, it's a spear which has got points that can block incoming attacks. Then as I said, you've got this side. It can be used historically supposedly to pull riders from horseback, but I've also found it's incredibly good at um, penetrating more armoured stuff because a good swing with this gives this spike a lot more of um, a penetrating ability. Now the main axe blade, obviously it's an axe blade. Um, on most types of halberds and pole arms this side is always sharp. This one has said I've not sharpened it so it's not really sharp. Um, but historically obviously having a sharp thing like that means if you're in formation and you needed to you could bring it across and down on somebody trying to maybe squeeze past the formation or it could be used against an enemy's pole arm coming in, you know, used to cut into it. I don't think, obviously, soldiers in formation did massive overhead swings with these. That wasn't really what they were designed for. Obviously, they're designed to be in formation, so you have lines and lines of men at different heights, all trying to poke their halberds through. Um, and if the front line's killed, then the next line can take their place, for example. So, a halberd primarily is obviously a formation weapon, as I said. So, what made them so good? Well, obviously all the points on them, uh, which is, you know, the point I want to get across. Now, another thing I found is very, very good of this halberd, um, that you'd have seen in the Riot Shield video if you watched it. Um, this section here is incredibly good for hooking. Um, if you get that onto somebody's armour or their shield, simply pulling back, the force of the pole means that person will not be able to hold on or they will be toppled forwards. So, if you have an enemy formation in front of you, trying to break through, you use this, you hook onto them and pull them back, you will pull them into other people's halberds or into somebody's short sword or whatever else in the formation. So the point is the halberd has lots of different little bits on it that make it superior to the spear. Because if you consider, if you have a formation of men with spears, for example, that are six, uh, six foot long, for example, and you have a formation of halberds that are six to eight foot long, um, the halberds are just generally more versatile because they're equally as good at thrusting, maybe a little bit off balance compared to a spear for thrusting, but you know, somebody who's trained to do it can do it well enough, and it wouldn't require much additional training for halberd use and spear use, but they've got, you know, more advantages. If you had somebody who was heavily armoured, um, that might pose a problem for a spearman, obviously. If somebody of a halberd can get a good swing at them, they could bring this down onto them, um, you know, puncturing through their armour and killing them pretty efficiently, or they could be hooked by either side of this, pulling them over while other men skewer them on the ground. Um, with a spear, you can't really hook somebody now. I'm sure there's variants of spears that might have sections on them that you could do that. But if you think of a primary kind of European spearhead, that was never designed for that. It was primarily just a thrusting weapon. So with the halberd, you've got a lot more ways it can be used. Now, it's obviously entirely possible that men further back in the formation might have been able to do this you know, bringing it down, um, while other men in the formation are obviously thrusting it. That is entirely possible, it depends, I suppose, how big your formation is. But the main point I want to get across with halberds, pardon the pun, is that just how versatile they were, because of all the different ways they could be used compared to just a spear. Now, going back to logistics, this makes a lot more sense, because if you're producing a weapon, you want to really be producing as few weapons as possible and training soldiers to use as few weapons as possible. So what makes more sense in a military formation to have some men with halberds, some with swords and shields, some with maces, you know, all these different weapons, 
or just loads and loads of soldiers with halberds and then lots of archers or crossbowmen. Um, you know, that way the halberdiers can protect the archers while the archers shoot into enemy formations. And again, how would you attack a halberd formation? It'd be very difficult. If you have um, soldiers on horseback, like knights, they can't really charge into a, a halberd formation because if everybody has their halberds braced and at different heights, um, the horse and rider would be skewered by riding into them. So a square formation with halberds, you know, really wouldn't work. Um, you know, charging into it, I mean. So that's obviously a big problem for the enemy. Now, what was used against halberds, sometimes effectively, sometimes it wasn't, was pike formations. Pikes being um, very long spears, think 20 foot. Now, the problem is that as much as you say, well, the pike can outrange the um, halberd, so therefore it's better, pikes had the problem of being quite unstable due to their length. So if you had a formation of men with really long pikes versus ones with eight foot long halberds, um, and the halberdiers were well trained in information, it'd be very hard to get the pike through without halberdiers, you know, cutting them or breaking them or just pushing them away using all the points on the halberd that the pike doesn't have. And of course, if the halberdiers close into a closer range, your pike becomes totally useless because of its length. So, you know, that's one of the disadvantages of a pike compared to a halberd. Obviously, the pike became very... it did kind of replace the halberd because what ended up happening is you had this weird arms race where lots of continental armies wanted longer and longer pikes to use with musket formations. So th the idea was that, you know, their pikes might be a few feet longer than the enemy pikes, therefore they could poke them from a bit further away. Which is kind of a novel concept, but it ended up becoming ridiculous to the point where armies that just, you know, focused on having more musketeers actually did better, because, you know, they're more versatile. But there you go. So the halberd, in conclusion, why was it so good and, you know, similar pole arms like the bill hooks and whatever else and the bardiches, why were they so good? Well, simply because of the fact that they could do so many things. You can kill somebody wearing armour with a halberd, you can grapple shields away from a user, you can pull, you know, somebody else over, and you can use it like a good old-fashioned spear point. So, logistics, really. If you have one weapon that's easy to train a soldier to use, and it can do most of the things on the battlefield, it is superior really to weapons that have very limited uses that require more training to use. So if you think something like this would not cost much money at all to build, um, it wouldn't take much time to build, and it wouldn't take much time to train a soldier to use it effectively. Obviously it would take a bit longer to train soldiers to use them in formation effectively with each other, but it's still fairly simple, you know, compared to a lot of other medieval weapons. Uh, for example, I'm sure if I was given an hour to train using an arming sword or a longsword, an hour to train using a halberd, I could be a lot more effective with a halberd in that time period, um, you know, simply because it's a pointy stick at the end of the day. So there you go, hopefully this video has been useful. I know some people said to me, could I do ones where I talked more about the concepts of weapons? So if you're interested in why pole arms were so prolific, like the halberd and the bill hook and other similar ones, because they were cheap to make and easy to use and were pretty good at what they did.